it's my proud privilege to introduce to you the chief guest, the presiding deity of this function, and the the speaker of the day, uh, Ambedkar Memorial Lecture, who is uh, Professor T.K. Uman. Thank you very much for your attention, Professor Uman. Respected Nair Saab, Dr. Naik, and uh, the present Ambedkar Chair. I stand here with some trepidation because I always tell myself, an old adage, to teach John mathematics, not only that you should know mathematics, you should know John. I don't know you. And therefore, I really don't know at what level I should pitch my talk, although I have already written it out, being a formal lecture, and passed it on to the uh, organizers. As you might note, I have given the title, Analyzing Social Transformation, the Missing Subaltern. Part of the reason why I thought of talking with specific reference to subaltern is that predominantly this institution is one which is nurturing the subaltern. And towards the end of my talk, I will say that unless these things are done more and more, an understanding about India will remain incomplete. That's the real message I have. It is frequently argued, and correctly, that no society is static. All societies are changing. The only difference is some societies change fast, others change slowly. At least for quite some time, this was a phenomenon applicable to our own country. But latterly, possibly, the rate of transformation change has accelerated. A few years ago, to be precise, some 18 years ago, I was asked to reflect on the future of India. There is a journal with the title Futures, published from London. And they wanted me to reflect with special reference to Indian society, Indian nation state, and Indian civilization. And I have argued that one of the problems about India is there is no unified vision about India's future. There are competing ideas, and I have identified four of them. One I called cultural unity, or uh, I don't want to use the particular term which I have used. India is as a unity. Then the another view is that India is a multiplicity, that is cultural pluralism. And there is a third view that India is to be viewed as a cultural federalism. Some of you who are reading newspapers and following the debates in the media will very frequently say that, note that one of the tensions that we experience in India is between the union and the various constituting units. Although the first sentence in the Indian constitution says, India is a union of states. I hope you know that. And these three visions, it is frequently argued, and not without reason, and I concur with that argument, are elitist in orientation although they are different. And there could be a fourth vision, which I would like to call the subaltern vision. And this subaltern that I am referring to constitutes about 75% of the total population of India. I include three categories in this, SCs, 16%, STs, 8%, OBCs, between 50 to 52 percent. 
I mean, Mandal might uh, overestimate the number, but roughly it is that. So you add up, you get about 75% of the total population of India would belong to what is called the subaltern group. And yet, their ideas, their thinking is not adequately reflected in the futuristic vision of India. The Hindu nationalists believe that the Indian nation-state is a victim of centuries-old domination by outsiders, by which they mean Muslim conquerors and Western Christian colonizers. And their contributions, uh, these uh, Muslim and Christian contributions, remain alien accretions to the Indian ethos. The way out is to marginalize or eliminate the carriers of alien cultural elements from Indian society if they do not accept them and assimilate with the Hindu ethos. You would remember in the 1960s and 70s, a word which was very popular was Indianization. Without understanding that India is a multiplicity, there is not one India in one sense. I'm not talking in a political sense, but in a socio-cultural sense. Now, this idea was certainly not acceptable to many, and people have argued that India is not one, but many. The strength of India consists of its capacity to carry various cultural streams together. For the first time, the idea that India is one and it should remain one through a process of assimilation was articulated in the 1930s by Goldwalker. I will not go into it. There is no reason for that. Now, over a period of time, it should be accepted that through a process of Hindu consolidation or at as an attempt at Hindu consolidation, there has been some efforts to give some place to the uh, subaltern groups. I don't deny that. But the crux of the problem or the crux of the issue under this view is it is one nation, one people, and one culture. 1939, this view was actually articulated. I call it cultural monism, singularity of culture. Although all the time we speak about the diversity of culture, and I already said the first person to articulate it so vividly was Goldwalker. The second conceptualization visualizes Indian society as a product of gradual and continuous accretion of cultural elements drawn from ancient, medieval, modern or Aryan, Dravidian, Mughal and European elements, each of which in this perspective made a significant and indelible contribution to the composite and diverse cultural milieu of contemporary India. Cultural diversity is celebrated in this mode of conceptualization and dignified coexistence of different cultures is the kernel of this value orientation. In a way, the Indian understanding or conceptualization of what is called secularism is actually this. Again, I will not go into it. But the architect of this idea was none else than Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, and if you read his book, it will be very the discovery of India, it will be vividly <coughs> shown. Notwithstanding their difference, both cultural monists and cultural pluralists insist that India is a nation or, at best, a nation in the making. Similarly, both believe that to build the Indian nation, a strong centralized state system is a prerequisite. In contrast, cultural federalism conceives Indian society 
as a conglomeration of nations, or very frequently, nationalities is the term that they use, giving adequate importance to linguistic and tribal entities. The term multinational state is not very popular, but it used to be very popular, and particularly the leftist groups used to uh, designate India as a multinational state. According to this view, each of the constituting nationalities, be it Bengal, Tamil Nadu, or Santala, or Santalese, or Nagas, has its own cultural specificity that need to be recognized and nurtured. This means to sustain cultural pluralism, political federalism is a prerequisite. In fact, you reflect on this, you will find, as it stands today, today's India is a combination of these two perspectives, what I call cultural pluralism and federalism. Very frequently people think that federalism is a political notion. Yes, it is a political notion, but that political notion becomes necessary if the structure of the society, the complexity of the society prompts it. Otherwise you don't need a federal state. The above three conceptualizations are viewed as elitist by the traditionally underprivileged social categories within Indian society who together constitute the overwhelming majority, as I already said. Traditionally, the underprivileged social categories in India are the scheduled caste, 16%. When we say 16%, it seems to be small. 160 million people. And please remember, unified Germany, East and West, after unification, makes half this population 80 million. In India, the numbers are so significant, but we just brush it aside by saying that there are only this percent. And this applies even to minorities. Who are assigned this group, the, uh, the scheduled caste or to use the earlier word, the untouchables, they were assigned the lowest status in the Hindu caste hierarchy. The scheduled tribes, 8%, again 80 million plus people speaking, uh, strictly speaking, not the part of the Hindu caste hierarchy, but socio-economically backward being the early settlers in the hilly and forest tracts. Scheduled tribes are the earliest settlers. I know immediately there will be objections. There is a considerable debate on that. The Aryan Hindus are the original settlers. At best they have migrated to Europe and then returned. All these are familiar. But the fact is, all available historical evidence suggests that both Dravidians and Adivasis were here when the Aryans came. But again, that is not my argument for today. They are, I said, 8%. Then the so-called other backward classes or OBCs, certainly 50%. The peasantry, the artisan groups, the shudras, together put. Now, these three social blocks together are labeled in today's political vocabulary of India, Dalit Bahujans or oppressed masses. The value of hierarchy, which is legitimized what is called institutional inequality, sanctioned and sanctified by Hindu scriptures, provide the major source of this content to the Dalit Bahujans, whose conceptual perspective may be designated as cultural subalternism. I want to pause for a moment and let you know, there is no society, as we know, historically speaking, where inequality is absent. Inequality is present. But invariably, inequality is not justified. The only critical difference here, in the traditional order, inequality was not only sanctioned, but legitimized, sanctified. I don't want to go into history or even theological doctrines. You are familiar with it. According to the cultural subalternists, 
cultural monism represents the view of the traditionally privileged conservative caste Hindus. In contrast, cultural pluralism is upheld by the modernists who believe that secularism, that is the dignified coexistence of all groups and communities, is the cornerstone of Indian nation state. The cultural federalists too are modernists, but they insist that political decentralization is a prerequisite for deepening democracy. The constitution of India, Indian nation state, when I say Indian nation state, this is a term which I don't accept. I put in inverted commas, you will see it in the text. I don't think India is a nation state or India can ever be a nation state. And I have in my writings argued that India is a national state. And there is a critical difference between a nation state of the European type and national state of the kind that I am speaking. So although both these groups, that is cultural um, monists and cultural pluralists, uh, promise modern democratic values to all citizens, they do not actually give it in action to this cultural subalternism. It is one thing to promise. My language is Malayalam, and Nair Sahib's language is also the same. In Malayalam there is a saying that the cow in the photograph does not eat grass. Wonderful promises could be made in the constitution. But what is important is translating this constitutional vision into reality. And our concern is precisely that. So, I argue, along with the intellectuals now surfacing from the cultural subalternist group, that we need to create an alternate perspective so that the place which is deserving to the wretched of the earth, of the Indian earth, is really acquired by them. Now this is the broad canvas. Now I go into great detail, if I may say so, about the subaltern attempts over centuries. Uh, you will not have the patience and I may not have the time to go into all this, but I will mention some of this as I pass on. It is not that the subalternists were keeping quiet. My argument is, in spite of the fact that protests and mobilizations have been happening for centuries, true transformation has not come about. The first of these, if I go back in the, to the history of protest movements, is the bhakti movements. And the idea behind bhakti movements was to purify Hinduism and to scissor the unacceptable accretions which have happened over a period of time. There are movements like Veda Saivism in South, particularly in Karnataka, and Adi Samaj in the North. And these movements were essentially attempts, as I said, to, to purify Hinduism so that the kind of evils which persisted over centuries can be done away with. There was another set of movements which wanted to, wanted the Sabastan people to move out of the Hindu fold, usually referred to as conversion movements. And the conversion movements both to Indic and non-Indic religions. For example, Conversions have happened both to Buddhism as well as Sikhism, two religions which originated in India, as well as to Islam and Christianity, two religions which have come to India from outside. But all available evidence show that these, the, the first I talk about the Vira uh, Saivism and Ari Samaj very briefly, these movements have not actually resulted in the annihilation of caste. In one way or another, for reasons which are specific to India, caste system has been reproduced, uh, has been reinvented with minor changes here and there. 
um, there, there used to be a sociologist by name D.P. Mukherjee who taught in Lucknow. He used to say, Mother India has a very powerful liver. She can digest everything. So there may be attempts to question the Hindu caste system. It has happened, and I have provided you two examples. But ultimately, the caste system, with minor alterations, continued, and it is continuing even today. Then there were uh, attempts made by people like Kabir. It is 1440 to 1518. He lived. You can understand how ancient it is. And here was a man who was trying to attack both Hinduism and Islam because of uh, the, the kind of uh, orthodoxies in them. But in spite of the fact that he has um, questioned the orthodoxies both in Hinduism and Islam, finally what has happened is a large number of sectarian groups have emerged and in fact caste system got replicated. The greatest challenge that Ari Samaj faced was the iniquitous caste structure and the abhorrent practice of untouchability. You see, I'm talking about a movement which is indigenous, which very much wanted to do away with the caste system, but it, it did not succeed. Because when people of untouchable background entered Ari Samaj, there was difficulty because they were not accepted by those who were above the pollution line, the so-called caste Hindus. And then came the phenomenon of what is called Shuddhi, that is purification. That's a ritual purification. It has nothing to do with hygienic conditions. So, a large number of people who became part of Adi Samaj had to be purified ritually. But even after purification, they were not acceptable to the upper caste converts into Adi Samaj. So, they invented a new idea. You may be a part of Adi Samaj, but as a brotherly, as a brotherhood, you will still belong to your antecedent caste identity. So if I am a lower caste man, yes, I am a member of Ari Samaj, but I am also a member of my old Biradari, so I have a different status. If I am a Brahmin or a Kshatriya, similarly, I belong to my Biradari. So you will find very interesting social innovations have been made in order to accommodate these people but at the same time accommodating with a lower status, with an inferior status. Also, some of the lower caste people who embraced Islam particularly were also subjected to Shuddhi movement and they were reconverted back into Hinduism through Shuddhi movement, but again they came to have the same position as they occupied before the change. Uh, some of you may know uh, that the Prime Minister has appointed a committee. It is popularly known as the Satcher Committee. And when they investigated, they found just like among Hindus, there are also three broad categories. Hindu broad categories are upper caste, OBCs and Dalits. Similarly, among the Muslims also, there are Ashrafs, Adilafs, and Arzals. With the results, even if they have gone back to their own religion or converted to or embraced Hinduism, they would really have a status equivalent to that of the status they have had originally by birth. What I am trying to suggest is that all attempts which have been made by reform movements in general did not succeed to, to, to really change the caste system. I did not deal with Mohandas Karamjan Gandhi in this paper because it is too well known. He endorsed what he called the Varna system, but he certainly opposed untouchability. He did say 
untouchability is the west blot on Hinduism. But in spite of that, he knows and we all know that untouchability by and large stayed where it is. Again, there are reasons for that. I'll come to that in a while. So this is one set of subaltern attempts to cast off the, the oppressions of the caste system. They did not succeed. Then, there are a large number of uh, conversions that have taken place into four different religions. And generally speaking, I have details here, but I will not bother you with that. The converts retained their caste status. If I am an Ajilaf or Arsal Muslim, I remain there. Even among Christians, I say even among Christians, because they believe that they have an egalitarian religious system. We all know, and it is approved several times over, that the untouchable who embraced Christianity was treated with some minor modifications as an untouchable. I grew up in Kerala. I know vividly how when a lower caste man becomes a Christian, how he is actually treated or even addressed. In fact, the so-called upper caste Christians call them neo-Christians, new Christians. But this is also true of Buddhism. We have a large number of Buddhists. In fact, uh, Buddhism is a very interesting case. Uh, the present population of Buddhism, uh, Buddhists are about 0 0.7, 0 0.7%. But between 1950, uh, one and 1961 the increase of Buddhist population is by 3751 this is largely because of uh, Ambedkar and in fact it is this group which is designated as neo-Buddhist the old Buddhists do not really treat them as equals socially same is the case with Sikhs they are called must be six. Yes, a large number of the sick population, proportion of sick population have come from this background, but yet you will note that they are given a separate status. Incidentally, both uh, the, the lower caste or Dalit converts to Buddhism and Sikhism are accepted by the state of India and the kind of um, privileges, entitlements which are available to those who are still in Hinduism as Dalits are extended to these groups. But this is not true of some other groups, particularly Muslims and Christians, and I will not go into it. That's not my subject. Now, this is a broad set of protests that occurred in the beginning. But by the turn of the 19th century, with the origin and spread of national movement, a qualitatively different type of movement, which is now referred to as the backward classes movement, arose. The crucial difference between the current caste movements and the erstwhile religious movements is that while the latter attacked or opposed to Hinduism, the reformists, and wanted its adherents to opt out of the Hindu fold, the former, that is the more recent ones which uh, occurred by the end of 19th century onward to 20th century, wants the lower caste to continue within the fold of Hinduism without rejecting their religion. So there is a process of um, hand-holding, giving them the possibility of upward social mobility. Now we can differentiate between three uh, types of caste movements based on their goal orientation. One, status mobility movements. They wanted to go up in terms of their social status. Two, 
caste unity movements, consolidating caste groups, and three, caste welfare movements. Of course, although conceptually you can make this distinction, actually there could be overlap. A particular movement may shift their locus from one goal to another over a period of time. Now, the oppressive as well as elastic character of the caste system and the failure of earlier attempts to escape caste-based discrimination by opting out of Hinduism seem to have prompted many caste groups with low ritual status to improve their position by adopting the lifestyle of the norm-setting and value-giving groups. And uh, several Indian sociologists and anthropologists have uh, referred to this. Of course, the one which all of you or most of you would know is Sanskritization, a process through which the lower caste try to improve their lifestyle by imitating the lifestyle of the upper caste. But the fact of the matter is, Sanskritization invariably failed. It did not succeed. Then, there was another mechanism which came into being. With the introduction of census in India by the British, the census enumeration and categorization within the census became an important aspect of upward movements of the caste groups. And um, there is a large number of petitions if you go back into the social history of caste groups from 1901 to 1931 you will find a large number of uh, caste sabhas, associations, have been formed. The idea was these caste sabhas will appeal to the administrators of the time, the colonial administrator, that we should be given a higher status. Not that the state can distribute status, but recognize it in the census so that it will be of help to us. So that was another. There are some uh, very interesting cases, again, the Idavas of Kerala have uh, really moved up. The other day I was reading a report about Kerala, the latest. They used to be below the pollution line in the 1930s. Today, they have moved up. In terms of the secular status, just to give one example, representation in the state government jobs. They have exactly the same percentage of jobs in the government as their population is. No other group has succeeded. I am only giving an instance. Or the Malis of Maharashtra or the Nadars of Tamil Nadu. All I am trying to tell you is there have been some instances in particular provincial states or regions of the country where these people have moved up, succeeded, but they succeeded in the secular context. Not that because they moved up, the upper caste have started treating them as equals, and that is my point. So, when the movement took place, it is also interesting, one, they are usually a big group. Demographic advantage was in there. The, if you look at the religious and caste groups of Kerala, to, to continue with my illustration, the largest number, if I remember correctly, 22% are Iravas. That means political clout in today's democracy. Now, it's equally true of uh, some other groups. But in some cases, like in Maharashtra, because of the support from above, the Maharaja of Kolhapur, for example, was supporting the backward classes movement. So, you will find various factors contributed to the movement of some of the groups which were previously referred to as other backward classes, not that they came to be accepted as a twice-born group, that is Brahmin, Kshatri or Vaishya, but in the secular realm they have improved their status. Then the third movement that I have uh, referred to is counter-culture movements. Uh, you know, I referred very briefly to the Aryan group, 
who believe that they are the original inhabitants. But the Dravidians contest this proposition. They believe that they are the initial group, along with, of course, the Adivasis. And the, the, the Dravidian movement, in the first instance, started as a cultural movement, now political and then parties, that's a different matter, have really took a position that the Dravidian culture is quite different, including language. Sanskrit, the most important language, the whole world in a way, which was actually one of the bulwark of the Aryan Hindu movement, the, the Dravidians say Tamil is more ancient and they are historically correct. And Tamil is more ancient than Latin and Greek, the, the two European classical languages. So they try to create a counter-culture uh, situation and say that we will not accept the presumed superiority of the Aryan Hindus. But politically they have succeeded, but did, is it that the subalterns have really improved their status in Dravida Nada, particularly in Tamil Nada? There is no evidence. There is yet another movement which came, and that is much more recent, that is called the Dalit protest movement. Again, you are all very familiar with that. To begin with, the uh, epicenter of the Dalit movement was Maharashtra. Gradually it has spread all over. So, the critical distinction is that the Dravidian movement was more a regional linguistic movement with, a, with an emphasis on non-Aryan elements. The Dalit movement was, of course, started in Maharashtra, now an All India movement, and some headway has been made because of their efforts in the secular context. Now, my, the purpose behind this um, elaborate view of protest movements against caste Hindus is to demonstrate that the Dalit Bahujans were not keeping quiet. They spared no effort to cast away their traditional chains. But the fact remains that they are still in chains, or largely in chains. Why is it so? And that is the short explanation that I will provide and stop the lecture. I have noted at the very outset that social transformation is conditioned by visions upheld by those who lead movements for change. While Dalit Bahujans have had a long and checkered history of mobilization, they could not project a unified vision. I am referring to nearly three-fourths of India's population. There are several reasons for this, and I shall list the major ones below. One, as I said, Dalit Bahujans are constituted or drawn from SCs, STs, and OBCs. They are juridical, legal, all India categories and not a sociological unit. And this makes a lot of difference because you think in terms of bringing people together because of certain deprivations, to a certain extent they will, uh, the, the movement leaders will succeed. But the structure of the deprivation vary vastly and hence the possibility of their acting in unison against a commonly perceived enemy, here the upper caste, is extremely limited. Very frequently we hear from political platforms that the Dalit Bahujans have to act in unison. But in reality they do not, and the question is why? The OBCs are placed above the ritual pollution line, and thanks to land reforms and green revolution, a substantial proportion among them has experienced economic prosperity. The numerical advantage of OBCs facilitated their emergence as an important political force. I don't know, many of you might not have seen it. There is a book which was edited in 2009. The title of the book is The Rise of Plebeians. The word comes from ancient Greek history where the population were divided into 
the patricians, the nobles, and the plebeians, and of course the slaves. So, the OBCs were referred to as plebeians, and uh, if you see that book, you will find there is an enormous amount of uh, political advantage that the OBCs have because of their numerical superiority. I tell my students, occasionally when I teach, you go back and look at the newspapers. Would you come across a single visible politician in the whole India or even the regional level by a surname called Yadava? Probably not. But today? Yes. Why? You have to see the importance, the numerical importance of universal adult franchise in a democracy. So, their deprivation, the OBC's deprivation is anchored mainly to underrepresentation in higher uh, echelons of bureaucracy, judiciary, and prestigious professions. To remedy this uh, status incongruence, the OBC are unlikely to align with SCs and STs. This is a logical argument I am making. If you look at the OBCs, you will find today, thanks to their numerical superiority, they are politically okay in terms of positions that they occupy. Because of land reforms and green revolution, they have arrived economically. And available data show a substantial proportion of the small entrepreneurs in India today belong to the OBC category. But when you look at the top bureaucracy, the one to which Nair Saab and uh, Dr. Naik belongs, IAS, judiciary, or even professors, which are not of any significance, but yet, recently I looked at the data, there are not even a handful of people, although they are some 50% of the total population. So this is what I call the status incongruence, which the OBCs suffer from. The scheduled tribes are not a part of the Hindu caste hierarchy, although the insisted tribes of Central India are often subjected to a process of Hinduization. But those estes who are incorporated into Hinduism vary in their ritual status. Some estes have been incorporated with the Kshatriya status, some with the OBC or Shudra status, and some of the SC status. Thus, at the ground you will find that the STs are uh, bifurcated into two or three major caste groups in the process of their being absorbed into Hinduism. Now, the Republican Party of India, founded by uh, Dr. <coughs> Ambedkar, to Bahujan Samaj Party, BSP, initiated by Kanshi Ram and nurtured by Mayavati could not project an all-India subaltern perspective. If RPI was by and large confined to Maharashtra, BSP's bulwark is Uttar Pradesh. Understandably, cultural subalternism has not yet succeeded in becoming a competing perspective to cultural monism, to cultural pluralism, or to cultural federalism. Unless this happens, Cultural subalternism will, will not emerge as an alternative capable of competing, let alone replacing other perspectives, even as the overwhelming majority of Indians belong to the subaltern category. The third, and a crucial reason for the non-emergence of subaltern perspective to garner and guide social transformation in India is their near total absence from the process of production and dissemination of knowledge. See, in any society, although people who produce and disseminate knowledge, people like me who are professors, I sometimes refer to me as a BPL professor, below poverty line, professor. Although they, we all say, look at the condition of teachers in this country, but that apart. Unless this group is active, you cannot think in terms of alternate perspectives. 
while not denying the role of organic individuals in initiating and accelerating social transformation, interrogation of the prevailing hegemonic knowledge system invariably calls for ingrained understanding of that system. Traditionally, not only that Brahmins were the only acknowledged producers and disseminators of knowledge, the Dalit Bahujans were not even permitted to imbibe this knowledge. You know all about it. Their traditional knowledge evolved through experience was not simply recognized but in fact stigmatized. Small wonder that Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was compelled to state that he was the only non-Brahmin scholar of his time. Only non-Brahmin scholar. Every scholar was a Brahmin. The systematic destruction or of the knowledge system of the Bahujans largely explains why a subaltern vision is yet to emerge. Very frequently we accuse our students and colleagues, oh your knowledge is textbookish. Actually the kind of knowledge that produced in this country traditionally is textbookish. It is not based on experience. The experiential basis of knowledge in this country actually belong to Dalit Bahujans, but that is not even codified. And that is a big deficit. Once the Dalit Bahujans were allowed to take to modern education, they responded positively to this new opportunity. But the production and dissemination of modern knowledge by and large remains the task of universities. Among the universities, the position of central universities is crucial because they provide more opportunities to do research, a prerequisite for knowledge production. And let me quote you the latest statistics. As on 31st March 2011, of the 5,876 faculty members in the 24 central universities, the faculty representation of Dalit Bahujan categories is as follows. Scheduled caste, 513, that is 8.73%, and their proportion in the population is 16%, as I told you. STs, 203, that is 3.45%, uh, which their population is 8%, and OBCs, the most dismal situation, 195. 3.31%. I refer to status in congruency, if you remember. They are all right, OBCs. But when it comes to professions, I am only giving a very ordinary profession, which is university teaching. They are 3.31%, although their total population is 50%. And if you move up from lecturers to readers to professors, when you come to the top, there is hardly anybody. If I remember correctly, I, I can't vouch for it. Old man with the faltering memory. There again, the OBCs have the lowest representation. Finally, and you must be now smiling, eh, because I'm going to stop. And most importantly, most theorists, even those who are of Dalit Bahujan background, fail to understand the bi-dimensional nature of Indian status system. Nowhere in the world you have two statuses. One status is a secular status. Another status is a ritual status. And I am very fond of, it is not here, telling my students, or when I get an opportunity, think of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. The most qualified man even of those times. Bharat Law. And you always see him, even in scorching heat, with a suit and tie and all that, which matters in this country a lot. And when he was practicing law in Baroda, if, if he waves for a Tonga, the Tonga man will not stop. Everybody knew who he was in spite of his appearance. One day, out of anger, he jumped in front of the Tonga and asked, what the hell? Here is the money. said, sir, I have no problem. Everybody knows you. If I carry you, they will boycott my Tonga. I cannot rely only on the money that you pay. Please pardon me, I have no problem. And you know, when Babu Jagajivan Ram was the defense minister of this country, the temple, Puri temple in your state, did not allow, that means 
the Brahmins there, the Pandas there, did not allow him to enter. I don't want to give more examples. So, in the secular status, they are at the top. Ritually, they are still there. I can give you 100 examples. Now, this is the basic contradiction of the Indian system. Not elsewhere. Elsewhere, if a man from the bottom comes up, they will celebrate it. They think this is a real sign of mobility. But here, we have two kinds of mobility. Mobility was possible and happened <clears throat> in limited measure in the secular context. It accelerated with the dawn of modernity in India. And a substantial number of Dalit Bhujans, although very small in terms of their proportional population, did experience upward mobility. But in the secular sphere, economically, politically, and even culturally. The Dalit Sahiti movement is a good example of the, the, the cultural mobility of uh, the Dalits. But no commensurate mobility was conceivable in the ritual sphere anchored to caste hierarchy. While one need not attest any kind of determinism, it is now well recognized that societies differ based on their core institutional order. I've written about it long ago, if I remember in 1967. I said, if you really want to bring about structural change in a system, you must attack the core institutional order. The core institutional order of Indian society is a ritual status in the caste system. And in spite of considerable upward mobility, in the secular sphere, the ritual sphere remains rigid. Again, two states in India try to train Brahmin, uh, sorry, untouchables, quote-unquote, to be priests. One is my state, Kerala. The other is Tamil Nadu. When these uh, Dalit who were trained as priests went to the temple, the temple priests did not allow them to enter. The priests from the Dalit background. There is a large number of interesting stories, one of which I know personally because I live or lived in a village in Kerala where there is a, a temple just across. The pujari threw the temple key into the pond, huge pond, and nobody can really locate it. Of course, an alternate key can be made. What I'm trying to tell you is the real resistance to change lies here. That is, the status incongruence or divergence between the ritual and secular status, <coughs> status system is a possibility and a reality. Dalit Bhujan movements, although wanted to dismantle the caste system, this fundamental objective was um, given up in the wake of the crumbs dropped to them in the form of material benefits. I am accusing the Dalit Bhujans for being, uh, uh, that their, their attention being diverted to small material benefits, which I call the crumbs. The real issue was fighting the caste system in terms of the ritual superiority of the traditionally privileged group. While this certainly did facilitate using the crumbs available, limited upward mobility in the secular context, the status system anchored to the iron law of ritual hierarchy remains intact even now. Unless this is interrogated and smashed, the ultimate emancipation of Dalit Bahujans will remain aborted. This is a task which Dr. B. R. Ambedkar initiated. I remember and I re read riddles in Hinduism, but did not accomplish because, because in my understanding, is other administrative and political preoccupations. Not only that he drafted the Indian constitution, as I told you, he founded a political party. So, the attention was diverted. It is high time that Dalit Bahujans start conceiving and conceptualizing a post-caste Hindu Indian society to rest their rightful place. And I hope this institution, over a period of time, will make a contribution towards this. Thank you very much. Thank you.